Hello and welcome to this very special interview on money control. I'm Mahalakshmi, and my guest for today is a rock star stock picker, Basant Maheshwari. Thank you, Basant ji, for talking to me today this morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Mahalakshmi. Good morning. Nice to see you after such a long gap. Absolutely, after many many years. So, Basant ji, the past year has been really bad for small caps and mid caps. So, I mean. we have come a full circle the frontline indices have conquered their peak we are somewhere there about but several of the mid caps and small caps are still languishing at levels way below their all time highs but you seem to be bullish on this space what makes you so bullish so the first thing the disclosure we have got it on the chin over the last 12 months it's rarely in our 20 25 30 years of history that we have encountered such a long period where our stocks haven't done well but this has been one of them because we took uh, in hindsight a wrong decision of going into small caps because we thought that the nifty has run its course so uh, now on the small cap side see uh, for any rally to be over whether it's a nifty rally or the large cap rally or the uh, small cap rally you have to suck the retailers in and i say this in good sense i don't say it in a bad sense it just means that the uh, final guy has to come into the market and the biggest indicator of whether the market is seeing the retail inflow into it uh, or not is the small cap because the retail normally buys a 50 rupee cement stock then a 7000 rupees ultra tech he would normally buy the second best to a hindustan lever he would normally buy the fourth best bank rather than buy a kotak bank so if kotak bank is hitting all time high no recommendations here uh, that doesn't tell you that the retailer has finally come in that tells you that the foreign institutions and the local institutions are pouring the money in so uh, going back to the context this is a technical view not a technical in a charting sense but an overall view that no rally normally gets over till the small cap start to participate because no rally gets over till you've sucked the last bull in that's the that's for the past but for the now for the current moment if you see the small caps have been battered black and blue most of them are down 40 to 60% from the all time highs so stocks don't fall more than 50 60% unless there is a survival issue with the company and most of these companies don't have a survival issue so because of that if you just do a 30000 feet analysis you would figure out that most of these companies are going to be alive for the next 3 4 5 years and if these companies are going to be alive for the next 3 4 5 years and they are already down 60% from the top it means that the valuations are dirt cheap though i always say that with small caps you don't have to focus so much on valuations and uh, there's nothing to lose from here so the worst thing you can do is if you buy small caps right now is you'll say arey arch hame ne ho gaye mere paise nahi bane but the chances of make of losing money from here in small cap is very low and remote okay why do you say these companies going are going to be alive for 3 to 5 years you said make two points one is that these companies are going to be alive for 3 to 5 years why would you even want to invest in a company if your visibility on the company survival is not beyond 5 years that's question number one second question is you said you don't care much about valuations in small caps why do you say that Uh, so two parts. Uh, when I say three to five years, it's three to five years in terms of growth, not in terms of longevity of the company as such. So, uh, for example, we did the small analysis on figuring out the kind of small caps that do well, and the ones that don't do well are second line textile, PSU metals, and fourth line banks. So these small caps don't do well. The small cap that do well was uh, is normally a consumer company. It's normally a home finance company. Uh, so these are the kind of companies that do well in terms of business analysis so small caps normally uh, when you are investing at them you should do more of a business analysis than a valuation analysis because if your scope of activity is small say if you have a revenue of 3000 of 2 200 crores it's easier for you to scale it up to 500 crores than for you to scale a 20000 crore revenue to 50000 crores because when you are 200 crores revenue it means that 90% of the country is untapped broadly so then it's easier for you to scale up you put up new distributors you put up new you uh, encroach into new geographies and uh, you maybe launch new products but if you're already doing 20000 crores and for you to scale it up to 50000 that takes a lot of effort so it's easier for small caps to scale up so a high valuation becomes a reasonable valuation the moment you have growth into it and that's why i say you should look at valuations but valuation cannot be the primary driver of small cap investing okay on the contrary 
one could also argue of course you are absolutely right i mean for a company to grow from even 100 crores to 500 crores is much uh, easier than a 1 lakh crore to 5 lakh crore kind of growth but on the contrary if you look at you know how resilient companies are when they are smaller but obviously they are much more fragile they are more um, they are more it, it's more difficult for them to take shocks and in the current environment whether it is input pressure or any kind of external shock to business including funding all of those are risks that small caps or smaller sized companies are far more uh, vulnerable to compared to larger companies uh, in that context would you still say that we can ignore valuations i mean you don't have to buy a small cap which go, which has got a large cousin somewhere so if you are buying a small cap steel plant maybe 3 million ton capacity they're not listed now all of them are folded up then you'll always have a tata steel or steel authority or a jsw or jspl breathing down your neck but if you've got a small cap consumer name a small cap a small cap home finance company for example uh, we made a lot of money buying group finance and repco about a decade back so they were small cap there was an hdfc limited there was an icici which was doing home loans but grew had its niche area covered so you don't want a small cap monopoly but you want a small cap that has got some kind of niche niche in terms of low cost of operations niche in terms of technical and promoters or niche in terms of a brand Uh, but but it's very difficult to figure out and get a small cap brand so you want a niche of some sort which can hold the small cap on its feet while you have the large caps breathing down the neck when i say large cap it means the big dominant players but you don't buy a small cap say in a cement uh, space for example like i told you where 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 the plant is located just adjacent to ultratech because the low cost of operations will obviously be with ultratech because they are operating with scale so these are kind of small checks and balances which people can do while they are figuring out and picking up small caps even there basanji for example if you look at automobiles versus auto ancillaries i mean you know the resilient and bigger companies to play that will be the original equipment equipment manufacturers the ancillaries and component players will be the smaller part but anywhere you go i mean the small cap mid cap will always be feeder industries and those industries usually end up bearing the brunt of the you know bar- bargaining power that bigger uh, bigger uh, consumer companies have and therefore the pressures uh, the margin pressures are also far more on smaller companies compared to larger companies again in tougher economic circumstances when there is so much uncertainty that pocket that pocket always looks far more vulnerable so my question is not whether to look at it or not are there pockets which you are seeing which are immune to these uh, kind of shocks Yeah, so uh, even in the auto ancillary space, you, uh, there, there was a company called Lumex Auto. I don't know whether it's uh, trading right now or not. I bought it about twenty years back, sold it off also. But uh, they they manufacture these tail lights for uh, cars and vehicles. So you compare a Lumex Auto maybe with an Exide or an uh, maybe a Seat. So Seat tires will always find some demand somewhere, and Seat gets. the tough end of the bargaining stick when it tries to negotiate with a maruti but when a customer drives up to the seat store or an outlet to change his tires then seat extracts its pound of flesh so now the thing is seat is not cheap obviously and seat is not a small cap even but if a small cap is down 60% from its high and it's making only stable margins which is like the large cap dominant auto producer will give it enough to survive but never give never give it enough to actually enjoy life so in that context the roe will tell you so the roe for most of these companies would be 12 to 14% which are normally supplying to dominant large automakers i take the auto example because you raised this point so you don't have to buy them but which one you can buy so about 10 years back there was this uh, company called an uh, uh, I, i mean an exide which didn't do well but there was this uh amaron batteries which used to amar raja batteries which used to make those batteries and they did well so these are the kind of spots and pockets where you have to find your own value and your own thing but you don't buy a wipe a company that's selling wipers to a maruti you don't buy a company that's selling maybe a shock absorber to someone because because the the munjal group has got its own sideways auto ancillary companies you don't buy them because they are made to actually uh see that the larger companies profits a little more so you have to buy those small cap ancillaries i again the auto space if we are talking about which have got a certain niche among themselves you don't have to buy the one which are normally doing a cost plus thing for the big main auto player so 
are you suggesting you focus only on business to consumer kind of companies which have brands or they have a direct sales channel to consumers because the tire companies you talk about or anything in that space uh, which will have its own momentum and pricing power is only something that sells to consumers straight away is that the pocket you're talking about b2c in a small cap space is a no brainer winner i mean if you get a b2c in a small cap space eight out of 10 times you've hit a winner it's it's like a home run you you won't get it in these kind of an environment yeah. because aapko pehle hi private equity usme ghus jata and private equity takes a stake and then when the private equity brings it to the market you have a dika and you don't know how to what to do with that so uh, but if you can figure out one so where you can figure out is even a home loan is a b2c if i can just extend the logic not in a yeah. classic sense but in a broad sense because i am operating in a niche environment for example there's a company called avas we don't own it it's too overpriced and doesn't yeah. grow according to our liking but those kind of companies and the erstwhile guru finance that was a small cap you could have looked at guru and said ki hdfc is the dominant player do i buy guru but hdfc would never have got into guru's territory because guru was a small cap guy who was doing in gujarat and maharashtra giving out 5 7 10 lakh rupee loans so the cost of processing such a small ticket loan size was too high for hdfc to be interested in that and hdfc is a 2 3 lakh crore loan book it cannot deploy in 5 7 10 thousand crores so these are the small things but yes you nailed it right but b to c in a small cap is an absolute winner if you get it so you used to own canpin home and repro home finance etc do you still hold them and is that a pocket you still despite no. the funding uh, environment yeah. now you're analyzing into state scenario we might still have one or two more rate hikes in this scenario do they still uh, do you still still feel bullish about them and the other thing that, you know now there is you know about a year back or you know even early part of this year if you looked at there was a lot of optimism about real estate now because the rates have gone up and suddenly you see that you know uh in the affordable category um, you know demand and you know if you look at other evidences uh, there is also some kind of contraction in demand so in this overall macro context that we are seeing now is home finance in the small cap space really interesting so uh, we don't own gru and uh, i mean repco and can i can find right now because we used to own it some time back but see the thing is uh, if you're looking at a uh, high interest rate environment so this interest rate environment maybe you can say it's high for the next 2 3 4 months then you will see a decline also and unlike us uh in india everyone's on a floating loan in us you have a fixed loan tenure because there's a fixed loan liability side to borrow so if a, if an institution can borrow for 20 years at a fixed rate it lends for 20 years at a fixed rate in india it's all floating so even if i'm taking a home loan i know 6 mahine ka uncha rate hai uske baad to rate niche aa hi jayega and uh, personal home loan is uh, normally a uh, uh, It's, it's it's as necessary as buying shampoos and toothpaste for most people so i think uh, in that context we think that home finance companies as such should do well because interest rates home these these are cyclical events if you have a five year view or three year view you will see five cycles or three uh, three cycles out of the five seven ten years over the uh, foreseeable future and you'll just try and manage it through it's easier to manage these rate cycles in india because everything is floating in us it's a problem because everything goes fixed so apart from uh, home finance are there any other pockets that you see as very good hunting grounds in the uh, mid cap small cap space yeah there are a few uh, consumer names you would say maybe a media streaming company that spreads its songs all over youtube so it's got its library of songs and with uh, the near zero internet cost of jio and bharti airtel people have a liking to free entertainment so they log into youtube and uh, they they can watch the songs all day long so every incremental rupee that these guys make flows directly to the bottom line so you would say can i put 20% of my portfolio there i would say no don't do it so what's the problem in those kind of companies the problem is there is no volume growth from the publisher side so you have a library of say 5000 songs all the hit songs but that 5000 hit songs cannot go to 10000 now that's going to remain at 5000 you are just hoping for the new guy to come in and listen to your songs and you get a cut of say 1 rupee or 50 paisa or 2 rupees depending on which song he opts for so these are the kind of small niche areas where you just cannot compete even if a reliance thinks that i can make the 1960s and 1970s ka song library it cannot do it because that's already a 
IP thing. So th that, that's the kind of space you look for, but you don't over allocate in those companies because first they are illiquid. And secondly, my problem is, even though we have them in the small case scheme that we have launched, my problem is there's no volume growth from the publisher side. You don't see songs growing at 20% CAGR, the song library. So that's a thing to think about. So, uh, so in these kind of companies, what kind of growth assumptions do you really make? I mean, how do you how do you even value them? Well, actually, these are companies which will grow top line at twelve percent or fifteen percent, but the bottom line will grow at thirty five percent. And the idea is because there is no incremental operating cost. So, if you are logging in to listen to a song, uh, maybe late evening. The company doesn't have to put a new person on the desk to cater to your demands. You just everything is automated. So with no with zero incremental operating expense, these companies transfer all almost all the incremental top line into the bottom line. So then are these film producing companies. Then there is a risk. Movie chalegi, nahi chalegi, hit hogi, nahi hogi. You want to be away away from those kind of companies. So sometimes the top line doesn't tell you the story if it's a platform business because the top line will grow at 12, 15, but the bottom line might grow at 25, 30. So that's the kind of view you have to take. And uh, you know, in a film business, like they say, in Bollywood, like they say, uh, you know, most of these companies have got their hands a little dirty in the past or in the future. So you don't want to over allocate, but you don't want to miss the opportunity because sometimes the numbers and the business model tells you that, you know, you just have to look at this company. So what we have done is we have a, law, a smaller allocation to companies that have any kind of risk. And we have a higher allocation where we think that this company, I mean, everything is risky in this world. Even uh, government sovereign debt is risky in theory. So we have a higher allocation to companies that are less risky and smaller allocations to companies which we think are more risky. Sure. So uh, when you construct your small cap portfolio, I mean, do you kind of take a completely bottom down, uh, bottom, bottom up approach, which is like stock by stock, you see what is the investment case for that and then construct? Or is there some kind of portfolio approach where you say, okay, I am uh, I am bullish on ancillary steel, or I'm bullish on uh, you know um, home finance or pockets, and then you sort of play the sector in a sense. You pick up three or four companies that are representative of that that segment, so that your risks are minimized. What is your approach? I mean I mean, in theory, you go bottom up and you say, Mujhe to aisi company chahiye jo 20 percent plus ROE kar rahi hai, 15 percent top line kar rahi hai, rang my honest and efficient promoters. Nobody knows what is honest and what is efficient except in hindsight. But then, you know, we figured out that you can get a bank in the fourth line bank, hai, sooner or later it's going to eat your capital out. So you don't buy a small cap bank, like I said, you don't buy a small cap textile company as such. If you want to buy, if you're so fascinated with textile, boy, you can buy small cap hosiery companies, but most of, but a couple of them are going through their own pain. If you are so fascinated with buying uh, maybe a metal company, you don't buy a small cap metal PSU. They are the biggest dogs in the market. They haven't performed for years. You don't buy a small cap PSU because nobody cares about them. So in theory, it looks fascinating to say we are bottoms up, but in practice, when you bottom up and you make a collection of 40, 50 companies, you immediately say, bhai, ye sector mein humko lagana nahi, isko hatao, ye sector mein humko lagana hai, ispe paise lagate hai. So, the bottom up analysis happens, but the stock picking doesn't go into the portfolio through the bottom up process, because there you have to screen them out, because by history they don't survive. That's the problem. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, what is your thought on PSU banks? Now, you know, the first round belonged to the big banks, the ICICIs, ICIs, SBIs, and all of that. Now, yesterday, JP Morgan even had coverage on, you know, has now coverage on PNB and has uh, re-rated it. So, slowly there is optimism coming into these large size banks, but probably small in terms of market cap. And then there is also the old generation private sector banks, which, uh, you know, now with, if there is a possibility that there might be some kind of consolidation because growth is coming back. Do you feel bullish on that space? So the original premise of buying private sector banks for the last 30 years has been they will take away market share from PSU banks. Yeah. So if PSU banks are such a great thing to happen, I think the private banks should start falling now because then you would say the PSU banks will again start growing at 15%. It was just a one-time re-rating that has happened according to us. And you know, uh, if I say anything on them, it will appear like 
it's sour grapes because we didn't have any of them. And I tell you that even if someone who had a Canara Bank or a PNB or a Bank of Baroda, he wouldn't have had more than a 2-3% allocation uh, into those names. So it didn't change his balance sheet. It just changed his PPT because he could put three more slides and say, we bought it here and we sold it there. That's it. So these things don't change life. What changes life is your allocation. You cannot bet too hard on them because for 10-15 years, they didn't do anything. So uh, if you would have thought that I would have bought PSU banks last year in October somewhere just before Diwali and I will sell it this year sometime after New Year, then you know it's too much uh, of an ask. It doesn't happen that way. But yes, if you made money out of them, you understand them, good for you. But for me, I would not buy them even at half book or one book or two book because nobody knows what the book is. And plus the basic premise, if there is the incremental lending growth going to come from? Because uh, the premise with which these three, four, five, six, seven lakh crore market cap banks have been built is they will take away market share from the PSU names. So I think that's the broad theory to look at. How how about the old generation private sector banks like the Karul Vaisya, yes, right. Federal Bank, oh, and many of those Federal banks which have yeah. traditionally yeah. had very really clean books, good management, well run banks. But even then, I mean the market has been treating them as though they were also also that. No, India is one country, Mahalakshmi. I think there's a big problem of the South K banks going into the North Indian territory and the North K people coming into the South Indian territory. I don't know what the problem is. Because Federal Bank, after so many years, it's still dominant in Kerala and parts of Tamil Nadu and lower Karnataka. Karur Vaisa Bank, same story. Of course, uh, Kotek went and bought... Uh, uh, Vesa also, but you know, there is this dichotomy, the mental thing, ki, yaar, wo north mein nahi jana, north ka south mein nahi jana. This is an interesting thing. So when we had Repco, one of my friend told me, Isme yaar, growth jab aayega, jab koi Dilli ke Kapoor sahab aayenge, jo advances book ko bhaayenge. So Dilli ke Kapoor sahab basically means somebody who is aggressive on growth. So that's the thing with these kind of companies that they, they have made their own niche territory that they will, uh, maybe a Murugappa group, it's very dominant, very trustworthy, very solid in South India. Maybe Muthut Finance is great in South India. But Bajaj Finance, for it to intrude into Kerala and get into Muthut's bastion, I think it's going to be difficult. But that's the thing with these kind of banks that where is the incremental growth going to come from? Because they don't expand territory because... I don't know what's the problem. Maybe the people have the preconceived notion that I don't want to uh, bank with some, something else than federal bank in southern India or in northern India. I don't know what's the thing. But they are comfortable in their own territories. Companies that are not comfortable and are chasing growth are the ones that make money. So I, I think that, 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 that that's that's the thing to consider. So do you see a special situation around here? I mean, uh, could there be good candidates for consolidation? Because many times when you're looking at these small uh, stocks or small companies, uh, uh, you know, a big trigger can be uh, an acquisition. So for example, a big bank or a private sector bank wanting to actually gain market share in a region, uh, these could be good candidates. Do you see those kind of triggers uh, coming to play, especially as credit growth grows and you know growth ambitions of larger players also becomes bigger? So my only interest of buying, I'm talking from a large bank's perspective, my only being interest of buying a small cap bank, uh, a small bank in southern India, northern India, anywhere, is for a banking license, which I already have one in case I'm a Kotec or an Axis or an HDFC or an ICICI. What I want, what do I get extra in return? I get the number of branches. I can always open them. Real estate is freely available. But if the RBI opens up banking license to outsiders and uh, foreigners and says business houses, you can come and I mean, buy any of these and have a buy banking license. I think a $2 billion on the table will be kept for just one banking license. Then these banks would be cheap. So normally in these smaller sized companies, there is a, at least a 150 to 200% difference in valuing a minority stake and a majority stake. So if I have a 51% in a bank, I can sell it at two and a half times the market price. But if I have a half percent or a 1% or maybe a quarter percent stake in a bank, I cannot sell it at even the market price. So that's the difference in the way the market values them. So majority stake has a huge meaning in these banks because majority means you can put it on the table and sell off and move out. So I think it's for the RBI to actually initiate this. But unless it happens, uh, these will be like companies that are great, that are great value, but who will unlock the value? You know, in Hindi, we say, jungle mein mor nacha kisne dekha. So it's one of them. It's brilliant. It's very nice, but 
you want somebody to come and buy it out also fair fair how about the chemical space because this has been one space where you know a lot of small caps have really graduated into you know mid caps and nearly large caps in the last 4 5 years now there is a lot of capacity in china coming up across the board do you see that as some kind of a leveler or threat to growth for chemical companies look chemical companies i think the best is behind them because they actually operated in an environment where there were capacity constraints there were climate issues and they had to export to europe and us and those places but with europe and us reeling under a recession so the long term trajectory is there all right but the best you know sometimes there is a capacity constraint there is the supply coming from india there's this china ka issue that's the best set up for them to do well so they will do well they are more of a compounders if you ask me the 15 20% type growers but the magic is behind them because the magic normally happens when the pe expands so they started from a pe ratio of 4 5 6 and went to a pe of 25 30 yeah. so from 30 40 pe you can't assume ki ab wo 100 ka pe ho jayega because uh, that's not how it they're supposed to happen they are basically a manufacturing company finally how about the pharma space i mean do you see traction there because every time i mean all these companies have a certain kind of run and then you know something or the other comes up it is either inspection by the fda or some kind of uh, query and then you know stocks come crashing down is that a space that is reliable uh, today do you think they are uh, looking better than before i mean the pharma the small cap pharma went up post covid pharma is more of a defensive play india doesn't have innovators india has only Uh, process initiative. No, in in the small cap pharma, there's too much of a problem. But yes, if you found a niche in a small cap pharma company, which we used to own earlier, when we sold off too early, it went up three x over the last five years. Was Granules India, and we sold off because it was an API manufacturer. It didn't have too many patents or things like that. But uh, they did well. See, again, in a small cap space, if you can hold your turf, have a niche. maybe for example in the sense that uh, you are able to ward off your uh, competitors from entering your territory and pharma means you have some kind of a niche either in terms of fd approvals or in terms of patents or copyrights or whatever so these are the kind of companies that can do well for example uh, in a large cap space obviously you have a cipla which will do 18 20% consistently for the next several years but in a small cap pharma space you don't have to buy them too expensive you paying 40p for a small cap pharma space be sure it's going to come down to 15p some day or the other because that's that's how these companies are supposed to behave so you have a company all right fine but don't overpay for small cap pharma that's that's my only thing basan ji give us three stock ideas you don't have to name the stock but articulate three stocks without naming them their investment case your best three plays for next year uh i mean since it's a small cap dedicated show i assume it's one of them so look for a private equity backed home finance company so why do i say private equity because humko to idea nahi hoga unka jaake books check karne ko whether they are lending or not lending whether they are embezzling cash or bundling out or over invoicing under invoicing so i need a private equity a smart guy who's already done his due diligence spent 3 4 5 months with the management yeah. gone through the books of accounts and invested money i want to piggy bank on that second is media streaming companies should do phenomenally well because i think the incremental revenue 80 90% flows directly to the bottom line but you cannot over allocate into those companies because the basic problem with those companies is the corporate governance apparently looks okay till it isn't okay so one of these companies which we have in our small case scheme and the small cap scheme so uh, we have a smaller allocation because i don't want to take the risk of actually going into a company which has got a bollywood angle to it because you don't know how things change and how they don't change and the third place i would say is it's not exactly a small cap but if you get a 20 30000 crore market cap company in a consumer space a b2c c space i think that's the one to look out for because b2c even 20 30000 crores it's i think very cheap and i think uh, some of these companies in the b2c space when you figure them out in a small cap category or a mid cap category you will always figure ki isme ye problem hai isme wo problem hai isme problem salad jayegi to wo large cap ho jayega so if it's a small cap it will always have some problem so you have to buy it with the problem like i always say clarity ka wait karoge to bhav bhi clarity ke dene padenge fair enough so how do you what kind of problems can you buy into or do you buy into and what kind of problems do you not buy into what is what are your benchmarks 
so my problem normally which i would not buy is if it's not a scalable business if it's got a large brothers breathing down its neck so if i got a small cap metal like i told you a steel company then it's a stada steel somewhere a jsw somewhere it cannot survive for 10 years but as soon as it is be bundled out you don't know to buy a small cap company that has got a 1000 crore rupee land with a 3000 crore market cap because you are thinking you will land bikega so even when the land gets sold you are not sure how much money will come into the company and how much come money will go directly to the promoter's pocket secondly if the money comes to the company you don't know how much will be paid off as dividend so it's a two three different level derivative analysis you don't want to do all that you want to say what are the companies that are going to grow top line bottom line have volume growth and expand its market share if at all possible but you don't want to think long shot here you don't want to have too many ifs and buts and then create a scenario where you think this is going to make money for me things normally have to be simpler for you to understand so that's a very cliched advice but that's the kind of thing we look for fair enough basan ji there has been a lot of optimism optimism around railway stocks in the last 2 3 months Uh, how do you size up that space one reason is of course that you know there is huge capital spend uh, expectation that there will be huge step up in capital spending in uh, railway second thing is the disinvestment trigger for you does that space offer any opportunity at all no no we didn't buy any of them so it's all sar grips for us but you know these these are stocks you cannot do a dcf also you can't say 10 years down the line ha theoretically you can but you don't know how it's going to happen Uh, and and you remember uh, i mean uh, in the olden days when you used to have the railway budget you always had these railway stocks moving up two months before the railway budget and after the railway budget all of them used to fall so because the government has removed the railway budget i think that's the markets way of celebrating these stocks but then you know uh, yeah, i don't understand how a company like this can grow at that rate so i think it's a one time re rating that has happened if at all but if you recall about 3 4 years back nbcc also went up the same way it went up multiple times and then fell 70% from the top so i'm not saying these stocks are going to fall 70% from the top but one has to be very careful when they are buying psu type small caps because uh, psus are governed with a welfare motive with a motive of doing good for the general nation and the public at large rather than for making money for shareholders and that should be kept in mind and people should go and figure out why nbcc fell 70% because at one time it was the most sought after construction company in india not too long back 5 years back i guess fair enough and finally what is your outlook for 2023 and how do we end or where do we end this year i think 2023 will give you back all the joy that 2022 took away from you that's my way of looking at it because the fed now there is so much of a struggle 7.2 7.1 kya inflation aaya nahi aaya are bhai zoom out 3 years 3 months down the future think we are in march somewhere in 2023 what are we discussing now we are discussing when will the fed cut rates so if you can zoom out 3 months 2 months because i always keep saying january 2023 the pain would be over that's the max thing because then after that the discussion will start on when the fed will cut or not cut so i think 2023 would be a good year the large caps have already shown the way that 2023 should be a great year because the nifty is already at an all time high nifty doesn't go to all time high when there is so much of discomfort and questions around so the smart money has already been buying them and i think it's time for the small caps to join the party they should do phenomenally and relatively better in 2023 and what do you perceive as the biggest threats or risks for next year the biggest threat mahalakshmi is normally something which you haven't conceived of so if i don't think ukraine is a threat unless putin presses the nuclear button i don't think north korea is a threat because we're all worried about that i don't think China's COVID zero, COVID one, COVID ten, COVID hundred policy is a threat because we've all got used to it. I think the biggest threat will always be the one which can come, and I will tell you how. High interest rates normally cause uh, financial mortality, so large banks normally collapse when interest rates are high. So that can come, but with the Fed and the European Union, they will become so used to it that. at the first slightest chance of problem they will try and nip it in the bud rather than handle it the best and in the leaven way they have had it once they won't have it twice so i think financial mortality is one should look for ki koi badi bank in us or europe doesn't go under but i don't think they're going to go under they've handled everything like this see what happened with the bitcoin scam the ftx scam i mean markets didn't even sneeze for two days it just took it in a stride and moved on 
See, these things affect you at the top of a bull market, not at the bottom of a bear market. At the bottom of a bear market, it just delays the recovery process. At the top of the bull market, they become the catalyst for you to fall or start falling. So with even a 30, 40 times leverage, the Barclays and the erstwhile uh, old banks of the Europe, European Union and those places, they've survived all this. So I think the only risk is of something which we don't know. And when it comes, we'll handle it. Sure, sure, sure. On that note, Thank you so much, Vasant.